church, let me encourage you, if you would, to go ahead and grab your Bible or grab a Bible around you and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. If, if you're new to Shades and, and don't have a Bible with you or perhaps you didn't bring a Bible today, they're spread out all around the room. And I would encourage you to go ahead and grab one so that you can see for yourself what the Word of God is saying. Please don't just take our word for it. Please read for yourself what the Word of God is saying as we walk through this time together. And we're going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 5 of Ephesians chapter 6. And I do want you to know, if you are new to Shades, we are so glad you're here. Welcome. If you're joining us online, welcome to, to what God is doing here at Shades. We've been walking through Ephesians for, for most of this year, most of this calendar year. And we've been walking verse by verse through this great book of the Bible, this letter written by the Apostle Paul to the early church in Ephesus, divinely inspired by the Spirit of God. And one of the reasons why we're walking verse by verse, I want you to know this, is because when we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible or a chapter of the Scripture, it causes us to have to wrestle with some things that we might sometimes want to ignore. It causes us to have to go into some territory that otherwise we might rather just stay away from. And so when we walk through the word of God verse by verse, it brings some things to the surface that at first glance are, are very difficult for us to see and hear. And today, I, I can assure you, today is one of those texts. This is one of those texts that, that many times it's just easier for preachers to to, to ignore or move past. It's, it's one of those texts that quite honestly, it's hard to preach, it's, it's hard to listen to, it's hard to read. It's a challenging text because of the language that is used. And so I just wanna ask for a favor right up front. I don't, I don't say this every week, but I, I am asking for a favor right up front today in light of what this text says and in light of just our current context and, and the reality uh, of, of where we live and some of the things that have been at play, would you just prayerfully walk with me on a journey? Because there's gonna be a tendency for some of us at first glance and at first reading to just dismiss or push back or bristle against what the word of God says here. Would you just go with me on a journey and let's invite the Spirit of God to show us what we need to see, and to use this day for the glory of God and for our joy as we look to the Lord. So that's, that's my request, that you, you can do with that whatever you will, but prayerfully we can walk together through this text and see what the Word of God lays before us. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 5, I, I would like to invite you to stand with me as I read from the Word of God, and this is something we do each week at Shades. If you're new to Shades, we stand for the reading of God's Word, and here's the reason why. Because the Word of God is the foundation for the people of God. It's what, it's what the church of Jesus Christ stands upon, the solid rock, immovable, unchanging, inerrant Word of God. And when we turn our attention to the word of God, we are turning our attention to what God says is right and good and true. We need to hear what God says. So we stand in, in reverence and in respect to the Holy Scripture. This is what we see, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And you're going to see right out of the gate how challenging these verses are because of the language. Because it starts this way, slaves. That's a hard word to hear. That creates all kind of visceral reactions for all kinds of different people for a lot of reasons, and it should. It's an offensive word. Why does the scripture use it? Well, we're gonna talk about that. This is what it says. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing, the scripture says, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Then it says, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, 
and that there is no partiality in him. We're going to pray together that the Lord will use this text in our lives to show us what we need to say to see. And I do want to say right up front, we need to pray that God would show us what we need to see because we need to hear from the Lord. This is a text that has been abused. This is a text that has been used to manipulate. This is a text throughout history that has been used in a harmful way. We don't want that to be the case. It's not a harmful text. For everything that the Lord lays before us is good. So let's ask him to show us how. Would you pray with me now? Father God, this, this is challenging. This is, this is difficult ground that we are treading on this morning. And Father, I just confess I do not tread lightly into this space. I'm asking you to speak through me. I'm asking you to give clarity through your word and to show us what we need to see, Father. You show us that your word brings life. You show us that your word lays before us truth. You show us that your word is good for the, for the heart and for the soul. Father, we believe that collectively as a church. And so I pray that you would show us that in this text today. That you would illuminate the beauty and the goodness and the kindness and the grace of the gospel through your word. Show us what we need to see. Have your way among us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. So what is this text all about? Why do we hear something in the scripture that at first glance, specifically where we live in the South, specifically with the history that we have in this nation, at first glance, this scripture can come across so offensive and even appalling. You may, rightly so, feel like kind of pushing back. What in the world is this all about? What do we need to see? We're going to do a little work here. Try to unpack this and give the context of what the word of God is addressing and speaking to. And I do believe there is something for every single one of us in this text here today. I, I try to say this in some form or fashion each and every week when we turn our attention to the word of God. I, I try to say something like this. There is something that you and I need to hear. There is something that you and I need to hear when we turn our attention to the word of God. And the reason I say that is because the word of God promises to us that it will not return void. That means the word of God does work in us every time we go to the word of God, every time we open ourselves up to the word of God. It reads us, it does work, it cuts to the core. And I believe this text is no exception. It's going to do work in us if we invite the word of God through the power of the spirit of God to do work in our lives. It will not return void. So what do we need to see here? Well, first, let's unpack that word that is so offensive right up front. The scripture says slaves. It's, it's talking to those who are held captive by another. It's talking to those who, who are in bondage, who, who are not free. This, this word is, is derived from uh, the original Greek context and the word that is used in the original language is the word doulos. It's a, it's a word that shows up all throughout the scripture. In fact, over 120 times in the word of God, doulos is used. And it can be translated into English, slave. It can be translated servant. It can be translated bondservant. But, but most commentators will say the, the most accurate and poignant way to translate doulos is to translate doulos into the word slave. That's what it means. This word is used to describe the first disciples. The so scripture says those who are followers of Jesus, who, who laid down their lives and gave up everything to follow him, they were, they were doulos of Christ. They were slaves of Christ. They were servants of Christ. 
This is the very word that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, uses to describe his own life and his own relationship with Christ. You can see this in in Romans 1. You can see this in other places. Paul says, I am held captive to the things of God. I am a servant of Christ. I am a slave of Christ. But here in Ephesians, and this is where it's specifically challenging to us, here in Ephesians, it is talking literally to those who were in slavery. It's addressing a very harsh reality. It's not endorsing slavery in any form or fashion. It's not supporting or condoning slavery in any form or fashion. But the Apostle Paul is addressing this very harsh reality that that was the, the, the reality many people were experiencing at the time. In fact, many historians will tell us that in the Roman Empire, in a city like Ephesus, which was a significant city of influence and and wealth and prestige and had many different types of trade and business, in a city like Ephesus, it's estimated that about a third of the population were those in slavery. It's a lot of people. This is a very harsh reality of the Roman Empire. It's a very harsh reality that is taking place in the world where the early church is first established. And so the Apostle Paul is speaking specifically to those who are experiencing this very harsh reality. Many Bible commentators will say that the majority of the first Church members, the first followers of Jesus in the early church, they, they came from a background of slavery. Many of them ha, had been freed in some way or another, but many of them were, were still in slavery at, at, as members of these first churches. Ephesus would be no exception to that. And so the Apostle Paul knows that there are those who are, who are in slavery who will be reading this letter. He knows that, that everyone who reads this letter will be very familiar with slavery. And so he writes specifically to those who are slaves and verse 9 to those who are masters. This is challenging. But what we see immediately in the word of God is that when the word of God addresses this very harsh reality, it addresses this harsh reality by calling out the church into something new. The word of God begins to tear down walls. The word of God begins to call people into a new people all together where there's not class system, where, where there's not social status, where it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you've been doing with your life. It does not matter where you come from or what you look like. The word of God is saying there is a new people. This people is called the church. This people has been saved by Jesus Christ and this people is called into something beautiful, something good, something unique and different from the world around you. This is a countercultural existence that is talked about in the scripture as it relates to the people of God. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as well. I want to turn your attention to a couple of other passages of Scripture, and then we're going to come back and walk through these verses in Ephesians 6. So, so let's, let's get started here in the Word of God in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Just turn a few pages back to the left from the book of Ephesians, and you'll come to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. Here we begin to see again, just like we see in the book of Ephesians, that the word of God ascribes value to everyone in the kingdom of God. And the word of God is calling out those who have been oppressed and calling out those who have been discarded and calling out those who have been seen as disposable and saying, you matter to God. You have value in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 7, 21 says this, were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. That seems kind of casual, does it not? But then Paul says, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself the opportunity. 
that was a reality in the Roman Empire. There were different ways that those in slavery could purchase their freedom, could acquire their freedom. And Paul says, go for that. That's a good thing. If you have that opportunity, by all means, take that opportunity to get out of slavery. But then the scripture moves forward. He says, for he who was called in the Lord as a slave, listen to this. This is where the Bible, the early church is creating a new reality. For he who is called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. It's a bold statement. Likewise, the scripture says, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. This statement is so powerful here in 1 Corinthians 7 in the context of the Roman Empire because the word of God is showing in the kingdom of God and in the family of God, walls are brought down. There is a new people that is being established in the church of Jesus Christ. Class systems are demolished. Unity becomes the bond in Christ, regardless of background. And there is an invitation to freedom that comes with the good news of the gospel. Did you see what else we see in 1 Corinthians 7? Not only is there this invitation to freedom for he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. But we also see at the same time, the scripture says, likewise, he who is free when called is a slave of Christ. So somehow the word of God is asking us to hold up this beautiful gift of freedom. If anyone is in Christ, he has been set free. If the son sets you free, you are free indeed. This is the good news of the gospel. It is to be celebrated. It is to be listed up. It is to be an invitation to all people everywhere that if anyone is in Christ, they are free because of the finished work of Christ. And at the same time, The message of the church, the message of the gospel holds up. If you are in Christ as one who is free, you are a servant of Christ. You are a slave of Christ. Your life is to be surrendered and laid on the line for the sake of the one who set you free. Now this can create some tension, especially based on what your background may be. Those who are coming into the church in Corinth with a story of slavery, they would be grateful for the freedom of the gospel. They might push back a little bit on on the call to be a slave to Christ. Those who are coming into the church in Corinth as as a free man and said, oh, okay, I've been been called to serve the the one who's given me this blessing. I, I, I don't know about being called a slave, though. This creates tension. Please don't miss this. The gospel always creates tension because the gospel meets us where we are and it takes us to a place we couldn't go without it. The gospel meets us on our turf and takes us in his terms to his place for our life. That's what Jesus does. And so in the midst of this Attention. We see freedom and surrender at the same time in the early church. This is exactly what Jesus said he was going to usher in. In fact, I want you to turn with me now to the, the beginning of Jesus' ministry on earth, the beginning of his public ministry. We're going to see this in Luke chapter 4. So, so keep going back to the left from 1 Corinthians. You'll come to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 4, we're going to look at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Right as the miracles begin to happen, right as the, the crowds begin to gather, right as the first disciples are called, we find Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry in the synagogue. And listen to what happens. Listen to what he says. Luke chapter four, verse 16. It says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. This is Jesus' hometown. 
And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. So Jesus comes into the synagogue, they hand him the old covenant, the the word of God, and he turns specifically in the scroll as it's open to the prophet Isaiah and he turns, you can read this later, he turns to a passage of scripture that we have in our Bible, Isaiah chapter 61. And he begins to quote this prophecy from Isaiah 61. It says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim. Listen to this. This is why Jesus came. This is the beginning of his ministry. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, listen to this, this is Jesus, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's where Jesus turns. Of all the places that he could have turned in the old covenant, he turns to Isaiah 61, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and then he says in this very dramatic moment, If this is a movie, this is where the music's starting to build, okay? This is where everybody's like, what's going to happen next? And we see it in Luke chapter 4. It says, he sat down after giving the scroll back to the attendant. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Listen to this. And he began to say to them, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is saying, this is why I have come. I've come to bring good news to the poor. I've come to set the captives free. I've come to bring liberty to the oppressed. I've come to bring sight to the blind. This is why I have come. Church, do not miss why Jesus came. This is what he's all about. This powerful, powerful moment that brings about the good news of the gospel to all who believe. So building on this proclamation of Jesus, the word of God is saying through the apostle Paul to the early church, don't lose sight of what Jesus is all about. And yes, we can get so focused on our place in society and our status in the culture and what's been done to us or what we've done to others. All of that is important to consider. But what is most important is what is your place in the kingdom of God? What is your place based on why Jesus came? In the kingdom of God, the slave is called free. In the kingdom of God, the freed man is called a slave of Christ. All who are in the kingdom of God through Christ belong to Christ. That's what we just saw in the scripture, that we've been bought with a price. Jesus gave his life to purchase for us the gift of salvation, the invitation into the kingdom of God, the right to be called an heir to the kingdom, the right to be called a child of God. This is the good news of the gospel. The son of God came to be a servant. He came to give his life as a ransom for many So that you and I, by his grace, through his shed blood at the cross, trusting him in faith, could be bought, so to speak, through the price that he paid at the cross to become a part of the family of God. So with all that in mind, that's our introduction. With all that in mind, We're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And again, these verses are challenging. But in the context to which the Apostle Paul is writing, where slavery was the norm, he is saying to those who are in captivity, do not lose sight of what Christ has done for you, and do not lose sight of the invitation that you've been invited 
to something new altogether. And regardless of your place in life, regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your hardship or your turmoil or your toil, if you are in Christ, your life can be used for the glory of God. Your life, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your story, no matter how challenging, no matter how difficult, your life can be used for the glory of God. So Paul is speaking in this specific context and he's saying to those of you who who are in slavery in the Roman Empire, here's how your life can be used to point to the good news of the gospel that you have received. Here's how your life can be used to make an impact, a a life of service, he says. Verse six says it this way, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Here the word of God is pointing to a high calling as one who is a servant of Christ. This is the the call to place trust and to place confidence in the promises of God. To stand courageously on the good news of the gospel that says if you are in Christ, you've been given a new identity. Your identity is not a slave. Your identity is a freed man in Christ. If you are in Christ, you've been given a new identity, not as an outsider, but as one who's been brought into the family of God. You are a child of God. And the good news of the gospel. So serve others, even those who you think are unworthy to be served. Serve others. Why? Not because you're doing it for them to please man, but you're serving others for the glory of God. And can I just be honest for a second? I I think many would probably agree with this. That's far easier said than done. To serve others not because of of what you may get out of it. To serve others not because it it might make your life easier. To serve others not because you're going to get the applause of man or a pat on the back. But to serve others. Why? Because it brings glory and honor to God. It points to his love and his grace through our service. Even of those who are difficult to serve. The word of God is saying regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what you are facing in life, you have been called to live with a heart of service, the heart of Christ. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the way you interact with others and the way you demonstrate a heart of service, this is not for just simply other people. This is for the glory of God to be revealed. And then the scripture gives us this amazing statement of a promise of God as we serve with the heart of Christ. Ephesians 6 verse 8 says this, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. See here the scripture says there there is a promise For the people of God. There is a promise for the followers of Jesus Christ. There is a promise for those who have trusted in Christ as Savior and Lord and have been called a a servant of Christ as a part of the family of God. And the promise is this nothing done for the Lord will be wasted. Nothing. Everything done for the Lord, everything done to advance the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, everything that is done for for the cause of Christ, it will will be used by God far beyond what we could even imagine. And maybe even more importantly to some of us, it will be seen by God. Some of you need to hear this because you feel like right now you're just living in obscurity or maybe you're doing things that no one's seeing or or maybe you don't have a, a big enough following on social media in your opinion or whatever that is. 
and you're going, man, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to, to live my life in, in a way that, that shows that I'm serving God. I'm trying to live my life in a way that brings glory to God, but, but there's no applause. There's, there's not much affirmation. There's really no one that's even seeing what I'm doing. Some of you are in really tough situations and you're serving faithfully and no one is thanking you and no one knows about it. And here the scripture is saying, the one who matters most sees. And the one who matters most knows. This is the call to do all that we do unto the Lord because the Lord sees all that we do. And this is the reminder that when we serve the Lord from a heart of Christ and an attitude of gratitude in what he has done for us, when we serve others with a heart of Christ, God delights in rewarding his family. It's an amazing thing to consider. In fact, this flows right out of a promise that Jesus makes to his disciples. We're gonna go to one other place in, in, in the Gospels, Matthew chapter 19, before we return to Ephesians 6, 9 and wrap this up. So turn with me, Matthew 19, verses 27 through 30. This is a promise that Jesus makes to his disciples, and it's a promise that comes because Peter, one of the first disciples, he's, he's, he's following Jesus, and he's looking around, and he's going, Jesus, I'm not really sure what to make of all this. Sometimes we go to places where people love us. Sometimes we go to places where people hate us. Sometimes we go to places where the crowds gather, and sometimes we go to places where people run us out of town. And Jesus, just in case you're not sure about this or in case you haven't noticed, we left everything behind to follow you. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes I'm really nervous. And so I just need to know, Jesus, like, have you seen this? Are you aware that we left everything behind to follow you? Like, are we going to be okay? What's, what's going to happen for us? Look at what Jesus says. Matthew 19, verse 27, sets that stage. Peter said to him, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said, here's the promise of Jesus. Truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is, this is Jesus speaking specifically to those first disciples. And then he says this, and it says, on purpose to everyone, everyone, everyone who has left anything, who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, listen to Jesus' promise, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last first. Jesus is saying, look, I... I hear you, Peter. I understand your concern. And I understand the reality. And please hear this, church, because this reality is very true today. I understand the reality. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. That if you follow me, you will have to sacrifice. And if you follow me, there will be many times where the culture will not applaud. In fact, the culture may actually be against you. I mean, Jesus makes that promise to us. He says to his first disciples, look, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. If you follow Jesus, there's going to be seasons of suffering. It's just a reality. And Jesus says, Peter, I'm very well aware of this. I know, I know that you've sacrificed. I know you've put it all on the line. I know you left behind everything to follow me. And I want you to understand that everything that is done for the name of Jesus, everything that is done for the glory of God, everything that is done to advance the kingdom of God is not in vain, but is seen by God, will be used by God, and, and don't miss this, and will be rewarded by God in the age to come. So Peter, I, I realize you've laid it on the line, but Peter, you gotta understand what you will experience in the gift of eternal life is so much greater than anything that you have lost or left behind that you can't even put a category on it. 
There's nothing to even compare it to. You're, you're going to experience the blessing of God forevermore, Jesus says. This is the promise of God. So that's why the word of God in Ephesians 6 says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what's your story, anything that is done for the glory of God will be rewarded by God. He delights in rewarding his children. So the question is, do we trust him in his word? Or are we more concerned with our current place in this life? Or are we living for what will last or are we living for what will be lost? You see, that's actually where the scripture takes us in Ephesians 6 verse nine, it takes us to a pretty sobering place. I want you to know, it would have been shocking, shocking to the first Christians, to the early church, when they read this letter and they saw that this letter speaks directly to those who are in slavery. That would have been shocking because those who were in slavery, they had no rights, they had no authority, they were often just ignored, neglected, pushed aside altogether. But the word of God through the Apostle Paul is speaking directly to those who are in slavery as if they're real people with a real heart and soul who have value to God. That's amazing in this context. Completely countercultural to ancient Rome. It would have been shocking. But what would be even more shocking is what we see in verse 9. That the word of God then turns from those who are in slavery to those who are lording over them in slavery, to those who are called masters, if you will. And here's why this would be shocking, because masters answer to no one. And masters can't be told what to do. And masters are in control. And masters are the Lord of the manor. How dare you tell me what to do? And some of you might even feel that way. How dare the word of God tell me what to do? How dare the word of God tell me how to live? I'm in control of my life. I will do what I think is right. But the word of God has the audacity to speak to those in the culture who appear to have the power and the authority. And to call them out and to say, if you are in the kingdom of God, if you are a follower of Christ, you've been called to something different all together. So what does it say? Ephesians 6, 9, masters, you do the same to them. What? Yeah, that's right. If you have power and authority, that power and authority has been given to you to serve. That's what it's for. This is a Christian ethic. This is completely countercultural to what was in place in ancient Rome. That if you have power and authority, that power and authority has been handed to you to serve. Not to get what you want, not to get your way, to serve. That's what the scripture says. And then it says, and stop your threatening. Who do you think you are? Because then it says, knowing that he who is both their master and your master is in heaven. So if you think you have power and authority, you must understand there is one who has far more. There is one who has far more power and authority than you, and you'll answer to him. In fact, this is the sobering warning that there is no partiality with him. There is no partiality with our God. We end this text with this challenging warning, a warning to anyone who has power and anyone who has authority in this life. It says, you are going to stand before God. Every single one will give an account. And don't miss this. 
No matter how powerful you think you are in this life, no matter how much you think you are in control of your life, or maybe you think you're in control of others, no matter how much influence or authority you think you have in this life, when you stand before the ultimate authority, when this life is over, when you answer to the one who is reigning over all, you will stand before the ultimate authority of God and give an account with your hands completely open. It won't be, oh, no, no, no. Didn't you see all the things that that I had control over in, in, in my life? Didn't you see all the things that I accomplished? Didn't you see all the things that I acquired? Didn't you see all the people that I, that I was able to boss around because I was in charge? No, no, no. When you stand before the Lord and give an account, you will stand before the Lord with your hands open. You will have nothing to say, look at me. And in that moment, The thing that will matter to a a God who shows no partiality is how have you responded to his son? Because you see, in the sight of a holy and righteous God, the things we've done in this life, they're really not impressive. The power that we have in this life, it's nothing compared to the one who is reigning and ruling over all, compared to a holy and righteous God. The things we've acquired or or the things we've achieved, they are nothing. They are like filthy rags. And the only thing that will matter is how have we responded to his son? How have we responded to the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. I love the way uh, an ancient old hymn makes this statement. The hymn is called Rock of Ages. And it says this in a chorus of this hymn, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. This is true of every single one of us. Regardless of our background, regardless of what we've walked through, regardless of what we've had or have not had, regardless of our family name, regardless of the way we look, regardless of what we think we possess or the amount of control we think we have, every single one of us, when we stand before the King of Kings, will stand before the King of Kings with nothing in our hands. And our only hope will be the cross. And this is what the word of God is saying to everyone, regardless of their place in life. The cross of Jesus Christ is your hope. It is the hope to the one who is oppressed. It is the hope to the one who is captive. And it is the only hope to the one who thinks he's got it all figured out. The cross of Jesus Christ is our hope. And the call to follow Christ is to remember who is seated on the throne and remember who we will give an account to towards and to remember that he who reigns over all is inviting us into something more beautiful, more incredible, more majestic, more gracious, more merciful than we can even comprehend. He's calling us to receive the freedom that is in Christ. And he's calling us to lay our lives on the line for the sake of the one who set us free. So how will you answer that call? Let me pray for us as we close our time here together. Father, when we walk through challenging texts, when we walk through your word in places that are requiring for us to think and to wrestle, it is my prayer, Lord, in the power of your spirit that if there was anything that I have said that is It's not of you that's outside of of the sound doctrine of your word. I pray, Lord, that it would be dismissed quickly, that it would be erased immediately. 
But Lord, the things that are of you that, that we've just seen in your word, the things that you've laid before us in your grace and in your mercy and in your kindness, Lord, I pray, I pray in, in the power of your spirit that we would wrestle, that we'd wrestle with these things. That we'd ask tough questions. That we'd humbly come before you. And Lord, I pray that you would do work in our lives for your glory. So in all these things, we come before you and we ask you to show us what, what we need to lay at the cross and show us what we need to let go of and, and, and show us what might need to change in our life and, and in our thinking and in the way we interact with other people. Lord, I, I pray that you'd, you'd, you'd meet us right where we are, but you'd take us where you know we need to go. The gospel would do work in us and that your church, your people here at Shades Mountain will be a people that live for your glory and demonstrate your love everywhere we go. Father, as we, as we prepare to close this time, I do wanna pray specifically for, for those who have really struggled with this message today, and I wanna pray specifically for those who are not even sure what they believe as it relates to a relationship with you. I, I know there are some that, that have really been asking important questions, spiritual questions. They, they've been really wrestling with what do they believe, and, and, and today, in the power of your spirit, you're drawing them back to the cross and back to the cross and back to the cross. And I pray, Lord God, that they would see the love that you have for them through Jesus Christ. The price that was paid to offer forgiveness of their sin. The, the price that was paid to invite them to be a part of the family of God, forgiven and covered by grace. And I, I pray that if there's any among us who have yet to receive that good news, that today would be the day. They'd say, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready to serve you. Oh, we praise you for your grace and for your mercy. We praise you for what you have done to call us out of darkness and into light. And we praise you for the promise of your word. Thank you for this time, Lord. Use it in our lives, we pray. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're gonna respond this morning to a song, a beautiful song that many of you've heard, many of you know. It talks about the way God works throughout the generations and, and what God does through, through the faithfulness of his people as we look to the Lord. Let this, let this song be a, a gift to you and a moment of worship for you as you respond to the Lord. And we want you to know as we sing and then as we conclude our service in a moment, some of our team's gonna be down front here and, and our team is here just simply to pray with you, to talk with you about anything that the Lord may be stirring in your heart. So if you know you need to make a decision of some kind to step out in faith or, or you need someone to pray with you or you're really wrestling with something in, in your own life that, that you just need someone to pray over, come forward as we sing. Come forward at the end of this service. For we'd love, we'd love to have the privilege of praying with you and and going before the Lord together. Let's stand now and let's sing as we reflect on what the Lord has laid before us. <laughs>